I don't know if you've done this. Sometimes I read so much about something that I lose the ability to know if what I'm saying is something I've come up with or something I've read. And I have to admit, today I've read an awful lot about this passage because it's a tough one for me to understand. And so, to be fair, I, I don't know how much of this is me at this point. <laughs> I've gotten totally confused. Um, I do think we live in a lovely time, though, that we have the ability to have access to so many resources. Like, if you read a passage of scripture that you find challenging or confusing, the number of resources you have at your fingertips is kind of limitless, and it's really good to take advantage of that. Uh, so the reading starts with Mark, where he says, they came to Jericho, and as he was leaving Jericho with his disciples and a great crowd, Bartimaeus, a blind beggar, the son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside. And there's a few things to know about this line. Uh, first off, Jericho is a very low-lying city. And often it's thought that when Jericho's in a story, it's kind of a reference point for the lowest forms of humanity. Something about like the, the sinful side of humans or the, the hard side of humans, the stuff we're not proud of. And so this is a story where Jesus is going right into the darkest parts. He doesn't shy away from it. Bartimaeus is an important name to know. It actually translates into son of impurity. So that probably hints at the ancient worldview that to be blind was caused by sin, either yours or your parents' sin. And the point is clear that this cursed man, this beggar, this lowest of the low, no one would approach this kind of person. You see, back then, almost every job involved hard manual labor, so anybody with any sort of disability whatsoever would have been very limited and very quickly found themselves as a beggar and then somebody to be avoided. It's interesting here, Mark talks about the crowd, but he doesn't say that they're on his side. It doesn't say everybody's there to be healed. It doesn't say everybody's there to be taught. It just says they're kind of around Jesus at this point. It's interesting to think of the disciples who are sitting or walking amongst this group. They know what they want Jesus to do for them, and he's maybe not that excited to do it. Part of what's happening in this opening of the scene is a bit of chaotic confusion. There's people who know things about him. There's people who are very wrong about him. There are people who are unsure about him, and they're all together by the roadside. I think for a group like us, maybe we could say if we are confused despite years of church going and we have many questions to ask Christ, we're in good company, the company of people who are with him here. So then it says, and when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This is the first of two times in a short passage he's going to say, Jesus, son of David. Now, many of us are going to run right past that because you're just familiar with that, right? Like, okay, Jesus, son of David, he's from the Davidic line, move on. But if you've read Mark carefully or recently, you would know this is actually the first time in Mark that he's referred to as Jesus, son of David. So far, he's been referred to as son of man. And quite emphatically, Mark here is saying something different. We're going to identify Jesus differently from here to the end of the book. Jesus is now the long-awaited Messiah of the Davidic line. He's being spoken of with specificity. This has not even been hinted so far in Mark. If you remember, Matthew and Luke start with these genealogies. Where did Jesus come from? Mark doesn't do that. So it's chapter 10 when all of a sudden you're getting this notion that Jesus has something to do with King David. And in a couple of chapters from here, he's going to enter Jerusalem with the donkey and do the Davidic king entry in. So what's striking about this passage, really, is that even though Bartimaeus is the blind man, physically blind, amongst the crowd, he seems to be the only one around him to be able to see Jesus as the son of David. 
right? So there's a spiritual sight on display in him. You know, even the disciples had recently been fighting about who's going to be at the right hand and the left hand of Jesus. They can't recognize Jesus for who he is. But Jesus is seen by the blind man, and then Jesus recognizes this faith, and he says, go on your way, your faith has made you well. Identifying Jesus, recognizing him is at the heart of this passage. Even when others might call us to be quiet, we are to call out to him. When others say, ignore Jesus, forget Jesus, prayer doesn't work, it's all made up, whatever the argument is, or the really ugly argument where we feel we are not worthy of reaching out to the divine, we've done something. Something's been done to us. Something's not working, and we feel the gap. This passage suggests you can still reach out to him. So then in 48, I love this, many rebuked him. They tell him to be silent, and when they tell him to be silent, he cries all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. I thought it would be fun to try this. You might not want to play along, but do any of you want to offer a guess as to why they're telling him to be silent? Like, it's not obvious in the text what's going on here, that they all think he has to be quiet. John? It's not the right time? Yeah. Any other ideas? I don't think there's a right answer here. I just think it's worth asking yourself, why do they want him to not call out to Christ? What is going on here? Janet? They think of him as low, yeah? Right, so what business does he have calling to Jesus from a low status, yeah? Afraid Jesus might help him, yeah. That's the Jonah story, right? Like, oh, what if God actually saves these people, then what? Yeah. Yeah, we don't know exactly... Why? Whatever their reasons, though, right, he's going to call out anyways. And I wonder, maybe the people tell him to be quiet because they're so used to dealing with people of this station that way. Or maybe they worry about the purity of Jesus. If Jesus gets too close to the beggar, does that demean Jesus somehow? So Jesus stops and he says, call him. And they call him. And they say, take heart, get up, he's calling you. They switch on a dime, right? They go from telling him to be quiet to like, get up, get up, come on, go faster, get ready. And I think where the world might see many reasons for distance between us and God or God and Jesus, Jesus disagrees and invites us into relationship with him. This is good news for every one of us who's ever failed to live up to our own expectations or the expectations that were fair of our friends or our family. But it's also hard news because we have to ask ourselves the question, if we are the church, we are the crowd, are there ways we keep people from calling out to Jesus too? Are there ways we tell them to be quiet? Throwing off his cloak, he sprang up, and he came to Jesus. This is a weird detail, throwing off the cloak. This is the kind of stuff that many people used to argue there's a historicity to the Gospels that you can't ignore. Like, that's a detail that is so irrelevant, it must have actually happened. It's also actually weirdly relevant. Because the cloak represents this guy's most treasured possession. As a homeless beggar, this is what keeps him warm in the cold nights. As a man of no means, this coat is probably the single most valuable possession he has, and he has to beg to find the money to maintain the jacket. 
He throws off the cloak, and when he does, he's leaving his former life behind. To those who have known sickness, to who have known poverty, to those who have known honor, and those who have known power and affluence, the image reminds us of this shedding, this transforming power that Jesus can have in our lives, this dramatic change. Throw off what you value. Throw off where you've been. Paul said he considered even the good things in his life as nothing once he realizes the beauty, the power, the majesty, the importance of Jesus. This guy throws his one possession to the side. And Jesus said to him, what do you want from me? And the blind man said, Rabbi, to recover my sight. And Jesus said, go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him on the way. This is the word of the Lord. And I find texts like this very hard. Do you think, do any of us think, if we just prayed enough, our loved ones would be healed? Like, is that the story? If you just had faith like Bartimaeus, then you would be fine? You know the story, the faith that moves the mountains? I don't know about you, I've never seen a mountain move. I've seen some prayers answered for sure. I've also seen a lot that seem to have zero effect in the world at all. <laughs> and I know I'm not alone in that. How can we take the Bible seriously? I can only speak for myself here. How can we imagine advising people to just ask Jesus for what they need? Because I've asked, and on the rare occasion, I've received something. But on the most part, like, people still get sick. Bad stuff still happens. If you get sick, you should pray, but you should also get medicine. Right? If you need money, you can pray about that, but you can also start budgeting. If you want to be generous, you can pray, but you can also start giving stuff away. If the primary purpose of a passage like this is to teach us that we just have to have enough faith and everything's going to be awesome, then it's not working. Some people might think that's how it works. Just ask and you receive, but I'm not really one of them. I have too many problems in my life. My family and my friends have too many problems that have been prayed and prayed and prayed over and not moved an inch for that to be the story. And thus I spend the week buried in commentaries. What do people make of this if not that? It starts with understanding the context of the passage, where exactly Mark puts it. You know, you have four Gospels for a reason. You have four writers, all inspired by God, but they also have their own truth, their own through line that God is giving them to say. So they don't put every story in the same spot. They don't include every detail in the same way. They don't order everything, and the order that they do put it in matters to them. So this passage happens in a travel narrative of Mark. It starts in Galilee and in Jerusalem. And it ends here, with Jesus coming face to face with a blind beggar named Bartimaeus, healing him with simple words, go, your faith has made you well. At the most basic level, this is a passage that shows you the power of Christ to heal. It's a compassionate Christ who brings good news and victory over the physical brokenness of the world. Jesus who promises to overcome everything that is wrong with the world. That's all true, but it's tough and it's incomplete. See, the section starts in chapter 8 of Mark. And there, Jesus does something funny. There, he meets a blind man in Bethsaida and he's supposed to heal him. And... Instead of doing it with words, like at the end of this passage, right, he just did this and like he hasn't touched the guy, nothing's happened here, right? In Mark 8, he has to rub mud on the guy's eyes 
And then he can sort of see, but it's not perfect. And then he rubs mud again. Like Jesus is having a hard time fixing that one. And then right after that, you get two chapters, 9 and 10, where Jesus deals with the spiritual blindness of his closest followers. So you have this blind guy getting healed in a slow, clumsy way. And then you have all these guys asking the wrong questions, saying the wrong things, not understanding what Jesus is trying to teach them. And then he walks down the road, and there's a blind guy on the side of the road and says, wait, that's the son of David. I know that guy. Jesus has been telling his followers, listen, the son of man will suffer. He will be rejected. He will die. And Peter argues with him about it. Don't say that. That's not right. That's bad for the momentum. That's bad for the movement. And then we hear the disciples and they fight. Who's going to be the greatest, James or John? Who's going to have the best looking tie and the nicest cufflinks and the whole bit? And all the other apostles are all mad at them for daring to think they're more important apostles than they are. You can just picture these 12 guys getting tired and hungry on a hot road. They're fighting. So then Bartimaeus finishes this whole thing, and Jesus confronts the physical blindness, but also the spiritual blindness. There's way more ink, way more time spent on the spiritual blindness than the physical one, and it's the blindness of his closest followers, the people who have been with him for 24-7, and they fail to grasp what the kingdom of God means. So maybe the lesson is, Ask and you shall receive. Or even if you had deep enough faith, you would be healed. Maybe it's all about the ability of Jesus to open the spiritual eyes of anybody he feels like. Maybe despite everything that would keep you from calling out to Jesus, we are just supposed to do it anyway. Whether it's other people who tell us not to turn to Jesus or whether it's our own struggles of faith when we feel unworthy to ask the questions, Jesus is ready for us. In our Bible study, I've had people say it's really interesting reading the Lord's Prayer like this because I've said it for 75 years, literally 75 years, and I've never thought much about it. And they're a bit embarrassed about that. I think Christ is working in people's lives when they then say, I'm actually going to study it now. He's not bothered that it took 75 years for the person to come and figure out what this story actually is about. He's happy. And then he says, what do you want me to do for you? I love that about it because he does not assume that you will want the most obvious thing in front of you. Right? You walk up to a blind guy who's homeless and blind and a beggar and the lowest of the low, all because he's blind. And Jesus does not assume that what this man would have resolved is his eyesight. There could be any number of things this guy asks for at that point. So Jesus asks, what would you have me do? And what I think that might teach us is that there's something to paying attention to what is the real deepest desire in your heart. Maybe it's the obvious you would have him do something, like if you have physical ailments and you would like them resolved. But maybe it's more hidden than that. Maybe it's a cry for forgiveness, something you cannot forgive yourself for. Maybe it's the ability to forgive someone that you desperately wish you could forgive but just can't find it in yourself. Maybe it's something that brings tears to your eyes so you don't want to tell anybody about it. Maybe it's something you want him to laugh and rejoice and have fun with you. The story suggests that even if you do not have total clarity about Jesus, you can go ahead and ask. You learn to spend time with him, and he will be happy if you do, no matter what anyone tells you and whatever objections people can come up with. Joshua Becker, this is a long quote, so I have this one written down. Joshua Becker says, It is true that spending time with with Jesus changes us. It was evident in Peter and John, and it can be evident in us too. The time spent with Jesus will still become noticeable in other ways to those around you. When you walk closely with Jesus, it affects how you live always 
and it may become evident in you when you refuse to partake in dishonest gain for work, or you act as a peacemaker during an argument online or in person, when you love your neighbor who acts unkindly to you in the first place. Quietly care for the young single mother down the street, volunteer in your community to serve others, choose not to embrace the entertainment put out by the world. All of these are examples of how being with Jesus can show up in our day-to-day -day interactions, and while we may never heal a man in front of a crowd, people will be able to notice something different about us. People will see something different because Jesus transforms us. So remember the foundation of this, if we want others to see the evidence of Jesus in our lives, it begins with spending time with him. The blind man calls out Jesus, trying to spend some time with him. So the story has a lot to do with spiritual blindness, and for some of us, that's just going to be internal, personal, our own spiritual blindness. For some of us, it will be more about the question then of what about all the people we know and care about who don't know Jesus at all? and are absolutely blind to any claim or unreceptive to any claim of the gospel. Paul says they'll never know about it if no one tells them. And then he says, but precious are the feet are those who bring the good news. Some of you have experienced this. You've had a doctor tell you the cancer is gone. Some of you have been told you're just getting forgetful, but it's not dementia or Alzheimer's, and you breathe that sigh of relief. Sometimes the doctor has bad news, but a very good plan of how to deal with it. Those are the feet that we like to hear. We can be that for people who are far from Christ, if we're willing. Statistically, we all think nobody wants to hear anything about faith, but it's also statistically true that most people actually do. The average person leaves a church because they move away, and then does not find a new church. In the United States, 75% of people in a survey said that they would welcome an invitation to church and would attend a church if anybody invited them. But nobody does. When we refuse to invite other people, we make an assumption that they don't need inviting. Flipping that on its head, when we refuse to invite people, do we do something like be that crowd getting in the way? I've told this before, but I had somebody once ask me if they needed a card to come in church the way they do at Costco. <laughs> they don't know. It sounds funny to us, but they're not sure they can come in here. And many have no idea what happens in here anymore. I did a wedding one time, and we did a prayer at the end. It was like a totally secular wedding, except like this final blessing of the couple. And most of the people, they kind of closed their eyes and they went like this, you know. And a, a lady came up to me, she was in her 20s, and she said, what happened there? Like, you kind of went like this, and you said some stuff, and everybody kind of closed their eyes and got quiet and looked like, what was that? I said, well, it was a prayer. And she said, oh, I've never seen that. Right, like in her 20s, she literally never seen this before in her whole life. People don't know. They haven't been invited to know. I did a funeral one time for a young guy who had died. He was in his 40s. And one of his best friends came up to me after. And he said, I don't know what just happened in there, but that was a spiritual experience. I said, well, you're in a church. <laughs> but he was not expecting anything to happen. He's been taught. He's been told. He's been convinced. Nothing happens. There's no spiritual thing out there. We think there is. Thought I would invite you to think this through a little bit. There are Sundays that are hard to invite people to church because it's beautiful and nice and like a marathon weekend or whatever. But there are other times where it's really easy to invite people to church. Mother's Day is a classic one, right? Remembrance Day is an easy one too. Because basically everybody knows somebody that cares deeply about the military history of the country. So maybe if you know somebody who's served in a military or lost family or friends in the military. This is the time that you invite them to our little humble service. And then we sneak Jesus into the service. Imagine. Think about it. Is there somebody that you could invite that you know that needs to know Jesus, who doesn't know them at all at this point and has been told not to go to church for whatever reason, and you can welcome them in? 
Final point of this, and then I'll stop, because I know I go too long, apparently. (laughs) In this passage, it says Jesus stopped. He's busy. He's going from A to B. He's a powerful man. People are building momentum. He's, like, going to be king of the whole world. And the homeless beggar guy that everybody wants to be quiet is yelling on the side of the road. And Jesus stops. He doesn't slow down. He doesn't shake his hand and keep moving. He stops. He has time for people. He has time for you. He has time for me. And he has time for the people we love. If you need to stop and to pay attention for the first time, you can do that. If you haven't felt close to him in a long time, you can call out to him. He asks us to call out to him. And whether it's people outside of you or it's you in your own story you're telling yourself that stops you from praying, Jesus will get over that. So we'll pray together now. Just and merciful God, we turn to you in hope and in gratitude. When the world around us calls us away from you, you call us straight back to you. We are grateful for your steadfast love. Thank you for your spirit at work in all times and places, calling out the best in your people, calling all people to you, overcoming the divisions we create, showing us when and where we must repent opening paths to reconciliation where we have offended. With the proclamation of your prophets and the compassion of Jesus in mind, may we seek your justice and know your mercy day by day. Father, we pray for justice for the earth, protect those creatures and communities at risk from the effects of dramatic disasters, or incremental changes in the climate. Open our eyes to see how we can live more responsibly and change our hearts to know you better. We pray for justice among the nations. Create a more generous sharing of resources between countries with good harvests and those depleted by famine where resources are extracted for export, protect the advocates for fair wages and environmental protection. Where there is aggression and intimidation between nations, raise up a willingness to make peace and settle differences fairly. We pray for justice in our court systems. Guide those who judge, prosecute, or defend to serve with integrity. That those who are accused would receive fair trials. That those who have been wronged are restored to the fullness of life. Grant those who are convicted humane treatment so that your spirit may lead them into rehabilitated potential. We pray for justice in the workplace. May those who work for others be treated with dignity and earn fair wages. May all who create work earn a fair return. Create equity and respect between those of different backgrounds and identities and guide young people to opportunities to develop their gifts. God, we all need some kinds of healing in our lives. We remember before you all those who are struggling with illness of body, mind, or spirit, those waiting for diagnosis or treatment, and all whose health challenges are invisible to others. Your spirit prays within us, O God, even when we cannot find the right words. 
So hear us this day and answer in ways that encourage our faith and change our world for the good. For the sake of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 